The last hormone that we're going to cover to finish off our presentation of hormones before we move on to cardiovascular physiology is pictured on 134G. And this is an absolutely unbelievable, extraordinary homeostatic reflex. Your kidney is an endocrine gland. I mentioned earlier, it appears almost every tissue in the body secretes hormones. So probably you never heard this in biology or anatomy. In fact, your kidneys secrete more than one hormone. The hormone that we're going to talk about that the kidneys secrete is a hormone called renin. It's easy to remember renin comes from the kidney because renal means kidney. This is called renin. Later, and not today, we're going to talk about another hormone produced by your kidney called erythropoietin. And if you may have heard of that because it's sold under a brand name called Epicrit or Epigen. We'll get deal with that in another time. So it secretes more than one hormone. Uh, now, there are specific cells in the kidney called juxtaglomerular cells, or JG cells. They are what secrete renin. There are three things that trigger these JG cells to start secreting renin into the bloodstream. The three things that will cause these cells to release renin is a drop in blood pressure to the kidney, a drop in the plasma sodium levels, or a rise, an increase in the plasma potassium levels. That triggers this hormonal uh, homeostatic reflex. Now remember what a homeostatic reflex is for. The purpose of a homeostatic reflex is to compensate or correct for a stress, for a problem. If you're too hot, the homeostatic reflex is you sweat to cool yourself down. If you walk, walk into a dark room, the homeostatic reflex is your pupils dilate to take in more light. If your blood sugar level is too low, uh, the homeostatic reflex is to release those hormones that raise your blood sugar level. That's always what homeostasis is about. So if, this, uh, it's called, if these three things are going to initiate a homeostatic reflex, the whole purpose of the reflex is it's going to compensate or correct for all three of these problems. Thinking about this, this makes this a very, very important reflex because this is a reflex that affects, in part, your blood pressure and it controls the two most important minerals or electrolytes in your body, sodium and potassium. Now, <clears throat> what does renin do? Renin is released into the bloodstream, and it acts on a protein circulating in your bloodstream. There is a protein always in your bloodstream called angiotensinogen. Now, we, where have we previously learned that most plasma proteins are made? In the liver. So the liver makes all kinds of different proteins. The main one it produces is a protein called albumin, but it produces many, many other proteins including a protein called angiotensinogen. Now, this is always circulating in the bloodstream. Renin activates it. It activates it and turns it into something called angiotensin 1. Now, uh, I might just mention that there are many proteins that have to be actually, quote, activated. And if a protein does have to be activated, the inactive form usually has the ending G-E-N, gen. And so then, when it becomes activated, you basically just drop that GEN ending. So it goes from angiotensinogen to just angiotensin. There's a, 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 we're going to learn other examples of this. I'll tell you two other examples. You, maybe you've heard of them, maybe you haven't. Your stomach cells secrete an inactive enzyme called pepsinogen. And the hydrochloric acid activates it into pepsin. All right, so it goes from pepsinogen to pepsin. Later, we're going to be learning in hematology about a blood clotting protein in our bloodstream called fibrinogen that is turned into fibrin. So these are just examples of what I'm saying. Now, how does it activate it? I, this upper diagram, you have to know. Right below it, though, you don't have to know this, but I'm just explaining it. Uh, angiotensinogen is a protein, a polypeptide. And this is the sequence of amino acids that make up angiotensinogen. You'll notice it shows here, you don't have to know this, renin cleaves or splits off 
four of those amino acids. So by cleaving or splitting off these four amino acids, that turns it in, changes it from angiotensinogen to what's called angiotensin 1. That's how it's, quote, activating it. It's actually made it shorter. <clears throat> now, we're not done yet in activating it. There is an enzyme in your lungs. I mean, this is the story. You, you, you would, it's hard to believe this is real. There's an enzyme in your lungs called ACE, which stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. As the angiotensin 1 is carried in the bloodstream through the lungs, this enzyme in your lungs converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Now, again, I want you to know that, but I'll just show you. You don't have to know this, but I'll just show you what that means. Here, this was angiotensin 1. What does this angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, do, do? What does it do? It splits off another two amino acids off that angiotensin 1, turning it into an even shorter polypeptide chain called angiotensin 2. So it's been cleaved or split twice now. OK, again, you don't have to know that. I'm just trying to explain activation. Now, angiotensin 2 is, is now in the bloodstream. It was converted from 1 to 2. And it circulates in the bloodstream, and it specifically activates the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone and other mineralocorticosteroids. Now, we have previously told you that the adrenal cortex actually secretes three different types of steroid hormones. Adrenoandrogen, glucocorticosteroids like cortisol, and mineralocorticosteroids like aldosterone. We have, in the last class meeting, we learned that what controls the release of cortisol and other, and other glucocorticosteroids was the pituitary hormone ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. But what's controlling the release of the aldosterone and other mineralocorticosteroids is this renin angiotensin mechanism. So this is controlled by a totally different mechanism than what controls the release of cortisol. Now, aldosterone is secreted into the bloodstream by the adrenal cortex, and it affects the kidneys. And what does it cause the kidneys to do? It causes the kidneys to do three things. Number one, and I'm going to start with number three here. One of the things that the uh, aldosterone causes the kidneys to do is to increase potassium excretion. It causes the potassium in the bloodstream to be excreted out of the bloodstream into the urine. So what is it doing to the amount of potassium in your blood? It's lowering it. It's causing the potassium in your blood to be excreted, to eliminate it, to get it out of your urine, to get it out of your body. So can everybody see then that that compensates for when your blood potassium level is too high. When your blood potassium level is too high, this renin angiotensin aldosterone reflex uh, causes your kidneys to excrete that excess potassium. This is why, as we learned a long time ago, there is not a warning label on every Chiquita banana not to exceed three bananas. Because if you ha were in the mood for having a banana split or a banana milkshake, I guess you could even make a banana daiquiri. All right? I know there's strawberry daiquiris. But OK, anyhow. So uh, it, sorry, sorry, I was thinking about something alcoholic. The, um, but anyhow, you got, you're in the mood for, uh, for bananas. And you know bananas are high in potassium. And as you eat them, you're going to raise your potassium levels. So why don't you have to worry about developing hyperkalemia? The answer is because if this whole homeostatic reflex is working right, it's fine. There's not a problem. There's no problem with you drinking extra water because you'll pee out the extra water. There's no problem in going into a cold room because you'll do, your body will respond to warm you up. So this is called homeostasis. This allows us to deal with life. So uh, that compensates right, for this. Now, another thing that the aldosterone causes the kidneys to do is to increase salt retention. It causes your kidneys to retain salt. This is the compensation for low sodium levels. So if your salt or sodium levels were low, instead of your kidneys peeing out that salt, you retain it. 
right? So you don't want to get rid of the sodium or salt because you're low in it. So that compensates for having low sodium levels in your blood. Now those are the two most important minerals or electrolytes in your body. So this is the mechanism that controls it. <clears throat> now we also said that a drop in blood pressure would trigger this reflex. The aldosterone causes your kidneys not only to retain salt but also water. And by increasing salt and water retention, and at this moment some of you might be thinking, isn't this like ADH? I'm going to compare and contrast this with ADH in a moment. This is not like ADH. Antidiuretic hormones cause your kidneys to retain only water. And the purpose of retaining water was if you're too salty, you retain water to dilute that salt and bring you back down to being isotonic. Here you're retaining both salt and water. You're actually retaining isotonic fluid, not water, but isotonic, salt and water. The purpose of this is to expand your blood volume. By expanding your plasma or blood volume, that raises your blood pressure. And of course, if this is raising your blood pressure, you can see that compensates for the fact that what initiated this reflex was included a drop in blood pressure. Now, if you're having trouble imagining how increasing salt and water retention, which increases in your blood, which increases your blood volume, which causes your blood pressure to rise, if you're having trouble in that intuitively getting, feeling this sense that if you're, the amount of blood in your vessels, it becomes more than normal, or at least let's say it becomes a bit more in your vessels, that increases the pressure in your vessels. If, that, if you're having trouble understanding that, consider the opposite. If you were bleeding, if you had cut yourself and blood is going out of your blood vessels, what's happening to your blood pressure? It's dropping. I think everybody gets that one. If, the blood, if you lose blood out of your body, as the blood volume drops, your blood pressure drops. Well, if the lowering blood volume lowers your blood pressure, increasing your blood volume raises the blood pressure. All right? So that's, uh, that how, that's how it's compensated. Now, this whole mechanism is almost really beyond belief. Uh, frankly, you might remember how I uh, had proposed that if I had been on the design team uh, for designing a human body, Remember how I proposed eliminating the lymphatic system simply by making the colloid osmotic pressure in the blood equal to the blood pressure so they would balance each other out so we wouldn't need a whole additional another system of vessels? I have another suggestion if I had been on this design team. You'll notice that what triggered this whole reflex was a drop in blood pressure, a drop in uh, sodium levels, a rise in potassium, cause the kidneys to release renin, renin activates uh, angiotensin into, into angiotensin 1, this enzyme in the lung converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, which causes the adrenal cortex to release aldosterone, and what does aldosterone do? It comes right back to the damn kidney again and causes the kidney to make these changes. You know, I would have said, Let's, let, you know, we can cut out all this. <laughs> if these three things happen, just make your kidneys do those three things. If these things happen, you know what? Let's skip all that. Let's make your kidneys just do those three things and that compensates. So if I'd been on the design team, I could have eliminated most of this. But nobody cared what I thought. So instead, it's got to go through this entire bizarre loop of things to come right back to the kidney where it began. I, I don't know. It's, well, it's just, a, just as long as it takes to go from one hormone to the next. So again, it's always slower than the nervous system works, but it's in a matter of hours. So uh, <clears throat> anyhow, uh, so that's the uh, mechanism. Let's, uh, uh, on the previous page, I'm sorry, on the next page, 134H, backside. So I want to summarize what we just said. And in the process, I want to contrast the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone homeostatic reflex with ADH, antidiuretic hormone. And I'm doing this because this is commonly where students feel they, they get them mixed up because they're, they're asking, what's the difference between them? Uh, 
Now, it's interesting that uh, the aldosterone is the last hormone that I'm presenting right now, and ADH was the very first hormone I presented. So, uh, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, where did it come from? You'll remember that it was produced by hypothalamic neurons that released it from the neurohypothesis. What did, uh, uh, now, what triggered the release of ADH, you know, from the uh, neurohypothesis? An increase in tonicity, saltiness of the body fluids, especially the cerebrospinal fluid. We had said that if you ate a lot of salt, you had salted uh, pistachios, salted popcorn, uh, pickles, uh, you get the idea, salted potato chips, you absorb the salt, now you're hypertonic. So well, that's not good. We don't want your extracellular fluids to be hypo or uh, hypertonic. We want them to be isotonic so that the cells won't shrivel up or swell up. So that triggers the release of ADH. You become thirsty to drink more water, and ADH, what does ADH do? Uh, ADH causes your kidneys to retain water, and only water. Now, we're, uh, you'll notice that I did indicate that a drop in blood pressure will also trigger ADH release, but I'm not going to test you on that. I put it in parentheses. I won't test you on it. Yes, your book mentions it. Everything in the body is, is multifactorial. There's always a multiplicity of things. I've also, we're going to ignore this part right here because we haven't gotten to the kidneys, so exactly how the details of how ADH works, that uh, deals with the details of the kidney. But what is the basic function of antidiuretic hormone? And it's called antidiuretic, it means it, means it stops you from peeing. You retain water. The purpose is to increase water retention, to retain more water, to maintain the tonicity of your body fluids, to keep you isotonic. When you're too salty or hypertonic, it makes your kidneys retain water rather than excreting that water. Maintain, that's its main function, to keep your tonicity at 300 milliosmolar. Now, uh, right below that, the next box, the next two boxes indicate the clinical problems of either having too much excess or too little, a deficiency. And you'll notice what we wrote is there has clinically never been a reported case of anybody overproducing ADH. Who knows what we might find, but obviously it hasn't been reported. So that's not an issue. But there is, has been reported clinical cases of where uh, the ADH levels have been lower than normal. They are deficient. And a deficiency of antidiuretic hormone goes by the name diabetes insipidus. And so this raises the whole question of what does di what's diabetes? Because this is called diabetes insipidus. Now, first off, let me just tell you that if you don't make ADH, what does ADH stand for? Antidiuretic hormone. Antidiuretic. It stops you from peeing. It causes you to retain water. So if you can't make this hormone, you pee a lot, right? All you do is pee a lot. You pee out a lot of water because you have no way of not peeing out a lot of water. You don't have this antidiuretic hormone. So what does the word diabetes mean? The word diabetes means to pee a lot. It means to urinate. That's what it means. It's a Greek word, and it means to urinate. That's what diabetes means. Now, so, uh, some of us are getting really confused. So I want you to know there are two types of diabetes. Two very different types of diabetes. The diabetes that we have spoken of previously is called diabetes mellitus. Mellitus is a Greek word, just like the word diabetes, that means sweet. It literally means sweet pea sweet urine. The person is peeing a lot and there's sugar in it. This type is called diabetes insipidus. This is insipid or brackish pee. Pee that doesn't taste sweet. Now you'd say, what do you mean taste? These two conditions were recognized by the ancient Greeks. 
They didn't have spectrophotometers to measure sugar levels in the blood or the urine. When people peed a lot, they would taste their urine. And if it tasted sweet, they called it sweet pee or diabetes mellitus. If they were peeing a lot and it didn't taste sweet, they called it diabetes insipidus. So this has been known for quite a long time, for people who had to pee a lot. Now, let me just remind you of diabetes mellitus, which is the more important problem of the two, because that's a much fairly common, this is rare. Sweet pea, remember we talked about diabetes back in section B, after we dealt with cellular respiration. We said that the fundamental problem in diabetes mellitus is you don't have enough insulin. So therefore, the sugar levels keep getting higher and higher and higher in your bloodstream, because without insulin, it doesn't transport the sugar into the cells. Everybody remember that? So it leads to hyperglycemia, and the sugar levels get so high in the bloodstream, it starts spilling over into the urine. So they start getting sugar in their urine. Remember that? So that's called glycosuria, glycosuria. And we know people have these little dipsticks that can test their urine to see if there's sugar there, and it should normally not be there. Because as the sugar starts to spill over from the bloodstream into the urine, it osmotically draws water with it. It's called an osmotic diuresis. When you have all this sugar coming out of the blood into the urine, because it's just so high of a level, it pulls water with it. So people who have sugar in their urine also urinate a lot. That is one of the classic indications that somebody might have diabetes. If you've ever filled out a medical questionnaire, one of the questions they ask is frequent, are you frequently thirsty and urinate a lot? And people who have uncontrolled, unmanaged diabetes have to drink a lot because they pee a lot because of this osmotic diuresis. Uh, they also, of course, have the smell of acetone on their breath. These are the things you're using to cue you in even before you've run the blood tests. The smell of acetone on the breath. The fact that they report that they're peeing a lot and very frequently. This is called doing a physical examination, a, work, a medical history, a workup of the patient where you're trying to figure out or sort out what's going on in them, even before you've got the results of your lab work, your lab test. All right, now, is everybody, so I've reminded you of diabetes mellitus. This is diabetes insipidus. So in this case, the person who has a deficiency who cannot make ADH, they always pee out a lot of urine because they don't make this count, a hormone called antidiuretic hormone that would cause them to retain water. So they have to drink a lot of water. All right, now that I've reviewed ADH, and also now we understand the word diabetes better, so let's contrast Let's contrast uh, aldosterone with antidiuretic hormone. All right, so aldosterone is a steroid hormone secreted by the adrenal cortex. As far as its factors that lead to the release of it, there are three things that trigger ultimately the release of aldosterone that lead to this renin angiotensin aldosterone reflex. The three things were a drop in blood pressure to the kidneys, a drop, a lowering of the plasma sodium levels, and a, or a rise in the plasma potassium levels. Any one of these three will trigger this reflex. Again, we're, we haven't covered the kidneys, so we're not going to deal with the specific uh, physiological mechanism of how it works. But uh, the function of the renin angiotensin aldosterone reflex is to increase salt and water reabsorption or retention. Notice ADH only increased water retention. So that's going to affect tonicity. If you retain both salt and water, that's not affecting tonicity. That's just causing you to retain more salt and water, isotonic fluid. And to also, uh, the aldosterone increases potassium excretion, the elimination of potassium out of the bloodstream into the urine. So its job, basically, is to maintain the blood volume and blood pressure and to maintain plasma, sodium, and potassium electrolyte levels. Now, just before the break, let me just uh, uh, mention these conditions. Hyperaldosteronism and hypoaldosteronism. These are not new words. 
The first time we mentioned these were on pages 41 and 42, when we were dealing with potassium problems. And in fact, one of the, quote, essay questions we you had was we asked you what could lead to hyperkalemia, and, uh, and many of you wrote uh, 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 kidney failure. Uh, and uh, what, what's the result of hyperkalemia? And you wrote depolarization of cells. And how would you treat that? And many of you wrote diuretics, and there's other ways. Well, other ways. So that was high, uh, 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 high, so let's just review this. Hyperaldosteronism. This is where somebody is over-secreting. There's an excess aldosterone. Now, what does aldosterone do? Aldosterone causes you to retain salt. It causes the kidneys to retain salt and water and excrete potassium. By retaining more salt than normal, it creates hypernatremia, elevated sodium levels. Obviously, these affecting sodium is always going to affect action potentials. <clears throat> it's not a fatal thing, but it, it does affect things. By retaining more water as well as salt, this increases the blood volume. Increased blood volume is called hypervolemia. Hyper means increased, vol means volume, emia means in the blood, increased blood volume. Increasing blood volume, we said, will raise blood pressure. But this, if you're producing too much of this aldosterone, you're going to raise the blood volume and blood pressure too much, more than normal, and that's called renal hypertension. So you have, you've heard the word high blood pressure, and then you've heard there's something called renal hypertension. This is renal hypertension. This is high blood pressure because of hyperaldosteronism causing excessive amounts of salt and water retention leading to high blood pressure. Increased blood volume and increased blood pressure. <clears throat> Another thing <clears throat> that uh, this leads to is that the person excretes excessive amounts of potassium out of their bloodstream leading to hypokalemia. Now, when the potassium levels in the blood and extracellular fluid become lower than normal, potassium in the cells start flowing out of the cells, and all the cells electrically become more negative than normal or hyperpolarized. Hyperpolarization of all the cells, which we covered back on page 41, and we've just been tested on it, but in case you've already forgotten, Hyperpolarization of all the cells causing, causes a slowing down of all electrical activity in the entire body. Everything slows down. The heart rate slows down, electrical activity in the nervous system slows down, GI motility slows down, everything slows down with hypokalemia. Remember we said that in an infant who had, develops hypokalemia, who needs Pedialyte, until they get that potassium, they're just lying there, not moving. Their heart rate's slower than normal. They're breathing with great difficulty. Everything has slowed down abnormally. All right, so that's hyperaldosteronism. Now, hyperaldosteronism is serious. It leads to some serious problems, but you don't die from it. The, we had said that the fourth hormone that was absolutely essential to life was this aldosterone. If you have hypoaldosteronism, a deficiency, you'll be dead. Why does this result in death? So let's again th think back. What does aldosterone do? Aldosterone causes the kidneys to retain salt and water and get rid of potassium. If you don't have this hormone, that means you won't retain salt, and your salt or sodium levels would come lower than normal. Now, that's not why you die. But obviously, that affects action potentials. By retaining not only less salt and less water, your blood volume drops. And if your blood volume drops, your blood pressure drops. Just the reverse of the other. And this is, and when, and this is called circulatory shock. You know, back when we were learning about edema and dehydration, and how blood pressure could, uh, increased blood pressure could lead to edema or drop in blood pressure could lead to dehydration. Uh, we had said that a drop in blood pressure is called hypotension or shock. Shock means low blood pressure. This is called circulatory shock. It is a drop in blood pressure because you don't have enough of this hormone. Now, you'd say, is that what you die from? This would be very critical, but you'll be dead before you reach this point. 
You'll be dead because of the other thing that it causes. Hypoaldosteronism means you don't, if you don't have enough aldosterone, you don't excrete the excess potassium. So let's imagine you've got this condition and you ate those three bananas. You ate the three bananas, you raised the potassium levels in your blood, you now have hyperkalemia, but without this hormone, you don't get rid of that excess potassium. Because now you retain potassium rather than excreting it. The, this hormone normally causes your kidneys to get rid of the excess potassium, but you don't have this hormone. So now you develop hyperkalemia, and as you answered on the te test, hyperkalemia leads to depolarization of all the cells in the body. And as all the cells start depolarizing, they start firing off action potentials. That occurs in your nervous system, increased electrical activity in your nervous system and brain, increased electrical activity in your skeletal muscles. But what you die from is increased electrical activity of your heart. Your heart rate gets faster and faster and faster and faster. It goes into fibrillation and you die. So that, that occurs, that's what usually kills the person, is the heart going into fibrillation from hyperkalemia. That, it's really the heart function that is the most critical one that is, you, is affected by uh, elevations or, uh, or decreases in potassium levels. It, it affects electrical activity of everything, but that heart, when the heart rate starts getting too slow or too fast because of either hypokalemia or hyperkalemia, then you're in big trouble. Uh, all right, so that's, uh, it was on page 42 where we originally talked about that, so now we've spoken of, of this. Let's turn all the way to page, the very last page of the cardiovascular system, page 272. 272. Uh, what is a normal blood pressure? And we're going to be learning a lot about blood pressure as we move on into cardiovascular physiology. The normal blood pressure is usually said to be about 120 over 75, 120 over 80. Now, of course, when you hear these numbers for blood pressure, that's your blood pressure in your brachial artery of your arm, because that's where they put that cuff. That's, the blood pressure is different in different blood vessels of your body. That's just where it is, what it is in your brachial artery. So uh, we'll be learning that you've got all kinds of different blood pressures. Uh, we've previously learned that the blood pressure in your capillaries is around, we've learned, 26 millimeters of mercury in your capillaries. Uh, the, uh, the units here are millimeters of mercury or tor. Now, why are there two numbers and why not just one? We'll get to that. We're going to explain why there's a high number and a low number because your blood pressure goes up and down and up and down. Uh, now, uh, before the break, we mentioned that uh, high blood pressure is called hypertension. The definition of having high blood pressure is a blood pressure greater than 140 over 90. Nowadays, they also talk about being borderline, high, ha, ha, having borderline high blood pressure of 135 over 85. But certainly, doctors normally aren't necessarily going to put you on any medication until you go above 140 over 90. Now, uh, we mentioned before the break about one out of every five adults in this country have high blood pressure. That's a lot, 20%, one out of every five. The etiology, the word etiology means cause. And we learned that there are two major causes of high blood pressure. And again, they further subdivide those. Uh, earlier today, we talked about two types of diabetes. Diabetes insipidus, from a deficiency of ADH, and diabetes mellitus, which is because of having too much sugar. And we know that there's different types of diabetes mellitus, right? There's a, a juvenile onset and late onset. So everything gets more complex. Uh, the, uh, the main thing we learned is that essential hypertension, which is what most people have, uh, technically it means we don't know what the cause is, but there's a general consensus that it's probably due to atherosclerosis. And that's why there's so much emphasis in reducing cholesterol levels and fat levels, which lead to that buildup of, on the walls of the arteries. Uh, there's a second type of high blood pressure we've learned called renal hypertension due to excessive amounts of that renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. And uh, this is where the aldosterone causes the kidneys to retain excessively, excessive amounts of salt and water, raising the blood volume, uh, contributing to edema, and raising blood pressure. Um, now, uh, most people have either one or the other. Could you have both types at the same time? Of course, you could have any combination you can imagine. 
Now, there are many medications used to control blood pressure. But among the two most common categories of drugs used to control high blood pressure are these two right here. Sympatholytics, or also known as adrenergic blockers or beta blockers. Have we ever learned about those? Because we know that stress raises blood pressure. And therefore, if we can reduce the sympathetic response of the, on the body, that may, can be used to reduce blood pressure. The second major category of drugs commonly used to control blood pressure are drugs that reduce, that inhibit, that block the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone reflex. Now, clearly, this category would be very appropriate for renal hypertension, wouldn't it? Because that's the problem, is too much renin-angiotensin-aldosterone going on, so that certainly makes sense to reduce that. Uh, they do, however, use these drugs even for essential hypertension, but in general, they tend to use the beta blockers more for essential hypertension. But again, they, there's a combination. Uh, another thing you will learn when you get into your clinical programs, uh, since we say there's different types of high blood pressure, we tend to see different types of high blood pressure in different people because there's genetic factors. So we know that people of, say, uh, African ancestry are more inclined to have renal hypertension. Uh, and uh, Caucasians more likely to have essential hypertension. Again, people can have both. But you'll learn that there are, because there's genetic factors, there are therefore ethnic factors. Ethnicity is just genetics. Now, I want to give you a couple of examples of drugs that block the renin angiotensin aldosterone reflex. So let's go back to 134G. Okay, on 134G, that's this diagram. Now, I've listed a number of drugs. There's only one that I'm going to ask you to know. This is 134G. <clears throat> if somebody does have uh, a, a hyperaldosteronism, which leads to renal hypertension, it certainly makes sense to try to reduce this aldosterone. The very first drugs, and I'm not going to ask you to know this, but the very, among the earliest drugs they used to try to reduce the aldosterone of action in stimulating the kidneys to retain salt and water, which leads to renal hypertension, were aldosterone blockers, drugs that block the aldosterone receptor sites on the kidney. If you've ever heard of the drug spironolactone, which goes under brand name of Doctone, have you heard of that? Yeah. This is still widely used. It's a very important drug. It's known as a potassium sparing diuretic. They are still very important. I'm not asking you to know it, but you, I promise you, you will learn it. Okay, it's a very important drug. But that blocked the aldosterone receptor sites on the kidney, which, now again, this, this is not all or nothing. All drugs work, it's dependent on dose. As you increase the dose, you get more and more blockage. So obviously, they just want to titrate it and uh, reduce the amount of aldosterone stimulating the kidneys so that the kidneys aren't retain retaining as much salt in water as it had been. And that should reduce the renal hypertension. Then after they developed those, a number of years later, they said, well, you know, since it's really angiotensin II that's causing the adrenal cortex to release the aldosterone, Let's develop drugs that block the angiotensin II receptor sites on the adrenal cortex. So then they developed angiotensin II blockers. An example of this, and I'm not asking you to know it, is a drug called Cozar. Has anybody ever heard of Cozar? It's another one you'll hear about. More recently, after they discovered that what's actually creating angiotensin II is this enzyme in the lungs that converts angiotensin I into angiotensin II, they develop drugs that inhibit this enzyme. These are called angiotensin-converting enzyme inhibitors, or ACE inhibitors. Very, very important. These are really very popular and commonly used right now. And all of the, and these I do want you to know. I want you to know what an ACE inhibitor is. Uh, these are, uh, all these drugs that are ACE inhibitors uh, go, have uh, brand names that end in IL, Zestril, Acupril, Prinavil. So they all tend to sound like that. There are exceptions. So I want to show you an example of this. So uh, you have uh, a, uh, 
a handout there that we gave you. So this is from a, a drug book. And we've already mentioned that drug books don't have pictures. <laughs> this is a drug called Quinapril. Now, I'm not testing you on knowing the name of this drug. I want you to know how this category of drug works. So uh, Quinapril goes under the brand name Acupril. Again, you don't have to know these drug names. You'll be asked to do that when you have pharmacology, and they'll have you learn, memorize names. But here's the point that I do want you to know. I think I, uh, I believe that, you, that, yeah, there's an arrow here. And so what is the pharmacologic category? Does everybody see that this drug is called an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor? And what is its uses in the management of hypertension, high blood pressure, and congestive heart failure? Now, uh, it, I'm not going to get into all this stuff. Look on the flip side of this. All right, so under mechanism of action, where I have an arrow. So how does, the, how does this drug work? It competitively inhibits the angiotensin converting enzyme, or ACE, preventing the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. Now, it talks about some other things that angiotensin 2 does, because angiotensin 2, which I'm not asking you to know, also constricts blood vessels. But you'll notice it also says, just a little bit below that, that there's a reduction in aldosterone secretion. Because if you prevent the conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, there's less stimulation of the adrenal cortex to secrete aldosterone. This is a very widely used class of drugs. You've seen this, right? So, um, so I do want you to know what an ACE inhibitor is. Why they, they want it, what they want to do is they actually, the trend is to develop drugs that are blocking earlier and earlier in this sequence. Uh, because therefore, each time you form the next chemical, even though this diagram shows that the chemical has only one effect, it's actually having a multiplicity of acts. And they want to back this up further and further, you know, and they're really eventually going to have something that stops the release of rain. Mm -hmm. that, that's uh, what they're working on. So the idea is just to keep backing it up further earlier and earlier in this mechanism. Um, okay, the uh, other uh, handout that I gave you uh, is this. Now, there's nothing I'm asking you to know on this, but just before you throw it away. All right. I mentioned earlier today that whatever hormones I cover, they're discovering that there's just hormones being produced by every part of our body. This, uh, this is not yet in any of your textbooks, at least at this level. This is basically new information that has only developed in the last few years that's only in journals. But uh, this comes out of Columbia University Medical Center, uh, where they have identified the skeleton now as a, the, meaning the bones are an endocrine organ. They have, uh, they, uh, it appears that uh, it secretes a hormone that helps control the sugar metabolism and your weight, especially in type 2 diabetes, uh, where there's a problem. So uh, they name, they've named this uh, hormone osteocalcin. Not, uh, it, not because it affects calcium levels, but it's produced by bone cells, is uh, osteo. So that's the name they've given it. And you can read the article, but here's the, uh, uh, also they mention, there is another hormone you may or may not have heard of called leptin. Leptin is a newly discovered hormone secreted by fat cells and uh, that also affects metabolism. So we're starting to see every type of cell in the body is secreting hormones. So as I said earlier, this whole kind of concept of an endocrine gland is breaking down. Now, the anatomy classes will still continue to teach it, but in physiology, it's becoming more and more difficult to talk about a classical endocrine gland. Look, we have learned already that adrenaline or epinephrine produced by the adrenal medulla is a neurotransmitter produced really by a ganglion of sympathetic uh, autonomic motor neurons. Oxytocin is a neurotransmitter. Right? It's not even secreted by an endocrine gland, it's secreted by uh, hypothalamic neurons. So, you know, everything's just breaking down. Anyhow, here's the main point of this. People with type 2 di diabetes have been shown to have low levels of osteocalcin. So if it turns out that this new, newly discovered hormone, secreted by bone cells, 
is actually maybe the cause of type 2 diabetes. So they're going to be developing os synthetic osteocalcin to give to people because they've got abnormally lo low levels. All right, it, and the last thing, on the flip side of this, in terms of diabetes, now, uh, and many of you are aware of what I'm about to say. You know, uh, diabetics classically who need insulin have to inject it two or three times a day. This is a big problem. Nobody likes having to use syringes and needles. And they have to guess the amount of insulin they need. Sometimes they guess wrong, and they've given themselves too much insulin, and their blood sugar level's too low. So this is a huge problem for they have, because they have to guess what their insulin levels are needed. So the new approach now, and I think, again, many of you know this, is to wear an insulin pump. The insulin pump, has anybody seen anybody with an insulin pump? This is like a, a device. It's connected by a catheter to the bloodstream. They wear it all the time. And it, 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 the blood flows through this device. It senses what the uh, sugar level is in the bloodstream. And depending upon what the sugar level is, it releases varying amounts of insulin. They don't have to inject themselves with a syringe. And it's much more accurate. And it only releases the enough insulin to keep their blood sugar levels normal. That's the best thing other, other than having the real pancreas do it. So the, everybody's moving to these insulin pumps. You don't even take it off. It can't. It's connected into the bloodstream. It's the catheter that goes into your body. Uh, and I mentioned this in the afternoon class. They said, well, that's like so weird. You've got this thing permanently connected to your body. If you know of anybody who has a pacemaker for their heart, you know what a pacemaker is? It's a battery-powered electrical stimulator uh, surgically positioned under the skin. And that's connected by a wire to the heart. And they wear it. It's under their, in their chest. And it's all the time stimulating their heart to keep beating. 